All right, students, I thought I would make a solution here to the exam three. That way you can kind of uh, look for yourself, kind of self-grade, uh, see what you did right or wrong. Well, I'm kind of working out the uh, solutions and uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you, especially those of you who took it online because I, I don't really have a way to mark uh, on yours. All right, uh, let's run through this. Here we go, a scientist plans to make polarized light from sunlight, okay? with a reduced intensity. And so the process starts off here in A, uh, using two polarizing filters uh, to reduce this to the intensity to 30%. So if I kind of make this circle and maybe the axis of polarization, we have light coming in, it has some initial intensity, and what we learned, and hopefully you remember, is you would block half of it and the other half would get through. And uh, not only would it get through, but the stuff that does get through would then be uh, vertically polarized. And that means then the second polarizing filter, which may be rotated a little bit, and, of course, it would be rotated from the first one. But, of course, uh, that would then... The important part is the angle between the directional polarization, which is the same as the polarizing sheet before it, and this next one. So let's just say that some angle theta. So then the intensity on this side would be reduced by a, faction, a factor of cosine squared theta, whatever that angle is between the transmission axis and the polarization. And of course, the light that's hitting the second one has already been reduced by a factor of two from the first one. And this is designed here to be 30%. Well, at least that's the goal. That's what that 30% of the initial means, which is great because then I can do a little math here, like cancel off initial. I can have then cosine squared theta equals point, and I'll move the 2 over here, point 0.6, and then I can solve for theta. And that's what this is right here, reduced to 30% of the initial. What is the rotational angle between the two polarizing filters. All right, so grabbing my calculator here, and I have a feeling I'm in radians. I am. Let me switch over to degrees. And then take the uh, point 0.6, and I guess, whoops, take the square root of point 0.6. Oh, uh, okay. Let me try that again. Let's take the square root of point 0.6. Looks like I hit the the, instead of the point, the blue eye there, uh, and take that uh, square root. So maybe I'll do this in two steps. So cosine of theta is 0.775, and so now taking the inverse of that last answer, and we're looking at about 39.2 degrees. Okay. So hopefully that was straightforward. In fact, maybe you noticed the pattern on the exam. I tried to give a really straightforward number one and a little more thought-provoking uh, part two or A and B. Okay, so on number uh, B here or part B here, we're going to throw in a third filter. All right, and so we already have the first one and then we have the second one. And now we're going to throw in a third one. Now, it makes it very clear here that the third filter is going to be added behind the other two, okay, from part A, so that the third filter is 90 degrees rotated from the first. So maybe I'll draw it this way. So we've got first one with the transmission axis this way. And, of course, what we hopefully have learned from this, and it's the same up here, is we already have then polarized light at, at some angle, and it would be off at some angle, which we now know to be 39.2 degrees. And that intensity right here is 30% of the original. So when it goes through the third filter, it's going to be like the formula we had up here. Uh, the intensity, I'll put it, the intensity after it goes through three of them is going to be the intensity that hits 
the third one, okay? And then times cosine squared theta. And here's kind of the crutch of this problem. What angle is that? And it is not 90 degrees because this angle represents the angle between the polarization of the light and the polarization axis. So they tell us that this whole thing is 90 degrees, but we also just learned that this is 39.2. So if you have, you know, something that looks like this, where the first one is vertical and the last one is horizontal, but this second one gives me light, angled at 39.2 degrees, then this right here must be the angle uh, between the polarization light that is now hitting the third polarizer, because it'll be the same direction as the second one, and the polarizing transmission axis. So if I go 90 minus 39, let's see, 90 minus 40 is 50. So it looks like we're at about 50.8 degrees. All right, so 0.3 times the initial times cosine squared of 50.8 degrees. Let's see what that comes out to be. So here's cosine. Here is 50.8 uh, degrees, and I will now square that. Okay, and then times the 0.3. And it looks like we got about 12%. So 0.12 of the initial. All right, so I think those are our two answers, part B here, right? What is the percent intensity of light after passing through the three of them? 12%. So after two of them, we're down to 30%. And now after three of them, with the last one 90 degrees from the first, we're at 12%. All right, so that's part A and B. And you can see B was a little bit harder, but not too much harder. That's probably going to change here as we go through the test. So again, hopefully you'll see A, pretty straightforward, but B, a little more uh, involved here. All right, so let's start with A. They got a nice little figure showing somebody observing an arrowhead through, looks like a diverging lens. A lens with a concave radius, uh, concave, a concave curve of radius 10 centimeters and a flat curve, that is a concave Plano lens, is made out of crown glass, which has an index of 1.24, and there is a 2, 5, sorry, 5, 2. Uh, there is a 3 centimeter tall object, and it is placed 6, so I'll put a 6, I'll put a 3, to the left of the lens. What is the position and the size of the image as viewed from the right? That is through the lens. And of course, a little hint, you'll need to calculate the focal length. All right. So I gave you a lot of hints across the test here, partly because these are pretty hard and partly because, uh, as you know, we had some weather shutdowns, which uh, didn't really affect you guys who are online, but uh, in-person people. Um, and, oh, and then I had to... Uh, go to a wedding. So there was a couple of days there missed. Um, but the equation for the focal length of a thin lens we worked out looks something like this. It's a pretty straightforward calculation, but like all of our optics, it's not so much the math as remembering what is our sign convention. And so let me put in, using our sign convention, so I'll put in the N. And the R is the radius of the first curvature. So as the light comes in, it hits this curvature first. So that's called the first curvature. And it says it has a radius of 10. Thing to remember, though, is the rules. And the rules say if the curvature for the lens is where the light originates from, what they call the front of the lens, where the light comes from, then it's a negative number. And so that you just gotta go right to table three in chapter 36 and say, okay, what is our convention? And we could have set up our convention in a lot of different ways. And so there is no uh, you know, way that we have to do it. Students always ask, well, you know, why do we have to do this? Well, we don't have to do it. We just have to have a consistency, just like you don't have to call to the right positive X, 
But if you do, then you have to call to the left negative x. And that's what we need to do. We need to call one direction uh, as positive curvature and one as the negative, and then you know stick by that convention and then interpret our answers by that convention. And that's then our, our convention. And you can, you can mix it up if you want, but uh, you just got to be really careful with that. Just like you don't always have to call to the right positive um, or call it X. Because sometimes we call down X and sometimes we call down positive and, you know, when we're dropping a ball. All right, but that's the convention. Table 3, Chapter 36. Um, also, we hit another surface. This is surface 2. So this is when it's leaving the lens. And so this would be this one. And so this would have the equivalent of an infinite, or maybe I'll just put big, radius of curvature to make this edge flat. And 1 over big, or 1 over infinity, is just a, a 0. So grabbing my calculator here, and I can do that in my head, so I'll just put point, uh, 0.25. Then I will multiply it by a negative 1 over 10 minus 0. I won't even mess with that one. And that, then, is a negative 0 0.052. And what I really want to know is its focal length. So let me take the reciprocal. And so that's a negative 19.2 centimeters. And of course, not a surprise at the negative, I hope, because that is our idea of a diverging lens. A diverging lens always comes out to have a negative focal length. That's another little one of those rules and properties you can see in Table 3 and Chapter 36. All right, so that's our, our first step. Then we can do the famous, you know, 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F, which means we can have the 1 over F. We can then subtract the 1 over P. Then we need to reciprocate that result, and we'll get the Q. And so I'm just going to bring this 1 over P over and then take the reciprocal. All right. So I need the reciprocal of F. And I already got F in my calculator, so I'll just hit uh, reciprocal. Uh, then I will subtract the reciprocal of P. And they gave this one as P being 6 away. So 6 reciprocal, enter. And then reciprocating that result gives me a negative 4.57. And again, not a surprise, we did learn that this diverging lens, just like the diverging mirror, and so the concave lens or the convex mirror, always made an upright, smaller, virtual image. And so if I can put this in the diagram, uh, from this person standing over here, it would look like the light's coming from here and a little smaller, although I haven't done the magnification yet. But the distance would be the 4. And the negative means before the light gets to, to the lens, the virtual side. And again, these are our rules that hopefully we've memorized from our table 3. Okay, so then when I do the magnification, which is minus Q over P, uh, the minus with this minus make a positive 4.57 and divide by 6. So, if I divide by 6 and kind of ignore the negative, I would say we've got our magnification about 76%. Now, I suppose technically I'm, I'm not done because it asks for the, the size. And so, to get the size of the image, which... The definition of magnification is size of the image over the size of the object means that the size of the image would be the magnification times the original size. So taking that point, it looks like in my calculator I still got the negative. Let me get rid of the negative. So taking that magnification and multiplying it by the height of the object, which is 3, we're looking at something that is 2.29 centimeters tall. So there is the location 
and there is the size. Nice. Now it gets a little harder. Um, in fact, <clears throat> that's why I gave, at least for you guys taking it in class, an extra page here because uh, mostly this would take up this, this page. And so maybe I should uh, do my calculations for B all on one page. So let me start there. Although the reality is I need this first information because it says in addition to the described above, now we put a concave mirror of radius 12. And let me stop right there because that means the focal length for the mirror is six centimeters. Remembering the focal length is half the radius of curvature. So getting the focal length of a mirror was a lot easier than the lens. And so we had this little formula for the lens and we have this little formula for the mirror, okay? Which kind of makes sense. A mirror only does one thing, reflect. Whereas the lens, it refracts twice. So we've got two surfaces and it depends on the index that makes that refraction. So again, got a little harder uh, equation. So fortunately for this one, it's, it's going to be easy to get the focal length then of the uh, mirror. And then we have to go and look at our sign convention. And our sign convention is this is represents a positive focal length for the mirrors. Now remember, the mirrors were described in table one. So everything else up to this point, I've been saying, look at the lens that was defined in table three. But in table one, uh, we have this definition. And, and, and in since the curvature is where the light is coming in, uh, which is where it bounces off and where the light actually goes, it's on the real side, the ver where, the, where the images are real. And so we have a positive number there. Okay. So sticking to our uh, sign convention, we can then know the focal length. And then we, we also say it is placed six centimeters to the right of the lens. So this is six. And let's keep in mind, so we don't have to do this math again from part A, that this right here is where the image is created from the lens. Because here's kind of the hint in this problem. When it asks for what is the position and the size of the image when viewed from the left, that is viewed through the lens, there's a nice little hint. The light goes through the lens twice. In other words, this is really three optical elements. The light goes through the lens, there's one, hits the mirror, there's two, bounces back, goes through the lens again, there's three. And so this person over here is going to see the effect of the lens twice as well as the as the mirror. And so we really have two more calculations to do. We already did the first calculation. And so maybe now I should refer to this as magnification number one as well as position number one. This is where things appear after it's gone through the mirror. And so these are the positions as it appears for the mirror, as the light comes from the mirror. So as far as the mirror is concerned, the light is actually coming. Now remember, this is six and this is 4.57. So this would be 10.57 as far as the mirror is concerned. And that's where I'm going to do my next calculation here. I'm going to say uh, 1 over P2 plus 1 over Q2 is 1 over F2. And this P2 is this 10.57. That's what I'm trying to describe right here. Remember the phrase we like to use, the image of the first one becomes the object of the second. And so that distance is a 10.57 centimeters. That's why it's important to know this number and that it's negative so you know which side it is so you can think about that as it has an effect on the next optical element, which in this case is a mirror. And of course, then I need to be looking for Q2. And as we said, the focal length is a six here. 
So that'll allow me to find number Q2, and for that matter, it'll also allow me to get magnification, because that'll be minus Q2 over P2. So grabbing my calculator, I've got the 6 and the reciprocal of that. And I will subtract off the 10.57 and take the reciprocal of that. I'll reciprocate that results, and it looks like we are looking at 13.88 centimeters for Q number 2. And then for the magnification, we have a minus of that 13.88, and then the P2 is the 10.57. So let me take negative of that answer and divide it by the 10.57. And it looks like I have a magnification of a negative 1. Point, let's call it 3, 1. And maybe it's worth drawing a picture because here's where it does definitely get hard. Uh, now, the light bounces off. Let's just assume for a moment it doesn't go through this, this lens. Uh, what this math has just said is it would form out here. And it looks like it would be inverted. See, that's what the negative magnification meant. And about a third taller, which is roughly what it lost the first time. Um, well, it lost 25%, which then makes it 75%, so you have to have a third gain to get back to the same size. So it looks like it's going to be upside down, but about the same size as the original object. We'll do some fine numbers in a moment, but that's kind of what I'm looking at as I read the numbers here. We're, we're about the same size, but now upside down. And we're 13, but here's where we got to interpret our numbers. We're 13 from the mirror. So this is 6, and then there'd be another seven, and this is supposed to represent six, so it's probably looking like that if the light did not go through the mirror. Now, sadly, it does, so this, this is not going to be the end of the story. This is not what this person's going to see. The light's going to be affected one more time, but again, our strategy is to figure out where the image is from the second one because that's going to be the object for the first one just like the image, this one for the first lens, now becomes the object for the second, which is the mirror. And so now the image of the mirror is going to be the object for the third step. So let's do all this a second time. Uh, 1 over P3 plus 1 over Q3 is equal to 1 over F3. Now, I suppose the good thing is we're going back through the same lens, and so the focal length is going to be the same negative 19.2 that we calculated here in A. I suppose we could recalculate it. You might argue, well, didn't these switch numbers? Yeah, I guess they did. And if you're kind of careless, you'll say, well, when you switch these, because it's a minus sign, you get the negative of it's like taking 5 minus 3 and switching it to 3 minus 2, uh, you get the negative. We call that an anti-commuting property. But our definition of plus or minus means we got to switch the positive and negative here because of table 3. So we switch the, the here and get a negative because of the math, but we also, because of the sign convention, get a negative and come out to be the same negative 19.2. So it doesn't matter which way the light goes through a lens which kind of makes sense because the effect of the lens is both surfaces. So it's not like you are only using one surface. So if you change the direction, you only you get the other surface. No, you always get both surfaces, whether you go left to right or, or right to left. So I'm going to save myself a little bit of time and not bother to recalculate that focal length. I know it's going to be the same thing. Um, and then this... Um, object distance is probably the tricky one here because it would be this distance here which would be that seven I think it's seven point eight eight does that make uh, sense I think that makes sense here because uh, yeah so it was 
it was 13.88 away from the mirror. And so if we are now measuring it from the lens, we got to take six away. And that's a 7.88 from the lens. But here, we got to also be careful with our sign convention. And again, let me draw your attention to table three. The P can be negative if we have a situation like this. That is, the object, or maybe I should say the image from the mirror is going to be formed here, and that's going to become the object number three. But what we do is we put in the lens before object three's light can even get there. And so this is the definition of a negative P. If the lens had been on that side, which is why we did those uh, step four and step five in the lab, they give us that negative P. Anyway, so I need to put here, using my sign convention, a negative 7.88 for this to work right. Okay, so now I can figure out, hopefully, what Q3 is. So let me take the negative 19.2 and take the reciprocal of that. I'll bring this to the other side so it becomes plus, and I'll go 7.88 and take the reciprocal of that. Then whatever I get, I'll reciprocate that, and I get a positive number of 13.4 centimeters. Now, hopefully that makes sense because if this lens wasn't here, it looks like the mirror was making the light come together and was going to form right there. And so the light is converging to this place. But then it hits this slightly diverse lens. And so it would be coming down and this lens would kind of reduce the amount of conversion. And now won't let it converge until a little further out. And so that distance out is, from the lens, what that number is, 13.4 centimeters. And so I guess this is one of the two answers I need for part B, because it says, what is the position? So the position here is 13.4 centimeters, you might say, left of lens. And magnification number three is minus Q3 over P3. And so we're looking at a negative 13.4. And then a negative, uh, yeah, 13.4 with the negative in front because of the definition of magnification. And then P3 is the negative 788. Uh, the two negatives cancel off, so I don't have any... Uh, in inverting going on, which, by the way, you'll notice why I then drew it, you know, but, you know, from here to here. The this is the object of the lens, and this is the image from the lens a second time. So I drew it in the same direction, and I guess I should have drawn it a little bit bigger because this does give me a magnification of about seventy percent. Um, and I drew it a little bit bigger, but not too much. Let me kind of correct it and draw the final image of the three and a little bit bigger. So here's the original object. This is the image position and roughly the size from the first lens. Then that becomes the object for the mirror, which does this to it, makes it a little bit bigger, getting it back to about the same size, moving it out a little bit and inverting it. And then finally, the light going through the lens a third time magnifies it again. Uh, doesn't invert it, uh, moves it out a little bit further, and so it's a little bit bigger. Anyways, this is magnification number three. So the total magnification would be the combination of all three effects. The first magnification, as we said, was 0.762. 
The second magnification was a negative 1.31. And then finally, the third magnification, which I already said, these are roughly going to cancel each other out, other than upside down. But uh, let's just see. Point 0.762 times a negative 1.31 times a 1.7. And sure enough, negative 1.6. 7, oh, yeah. So these almost exactly cancel each other out. And the overall magnification is about a negative 0.17. So the overall height would then be that magnification, negative 1.7, times its original height, which I guess is 3. And so times a 3 gives me a height of a negative, so it's inverted. About a 5.09 centimeters. And so there's our two answers to part B, which again says right here, what is the position and size of the image when viewed from the left? All right, so again, hopefully you can see, uh, A is pretty straightforward. B, ooh, a lot of steps here. But if you keep in mind that when you have a bunch hooked together, a bunch of optical elements, in this case three, the image of the one before it now becomes the object for the next one. And you just keep going along that way. All right, so there is a pretty hard part B. Uh, let's go on and try a number three here. And again, hopefully you'll kind of see that same pattern. Hopefully A is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have a lens again. Uh, this one, it's convex instead of concave, and it's convex on both sides, so it looks something like shown in the, in the picture here. Um, we've got flint glass this time. It has the same curvature, so there isn't a flat one. And then what's his focal length? So that's really kind of the same calculation. So I'll just put it here and then also remind you that uh, we probably need to go back and look at table three or either have it memorized or have it right there in our notes. It's okay, now, what is my sign convention? Because in this case, the index, 1.66 minus 1, and then we have a 1 over a 20, and then this is our definition of positive. When, if you're looking at this light coming from this box here, this is going to eventually become the object. Although, like I said, it doesn't matter which way you, you do it, you're going to come out with the same number. But I'm just going to pretend in my mind the light is coming from this box. And then it hits this surface. So uh, it hits a curvature of 20. Um, and then is that positive or negative? But like we said in the last problem, using our, our sign conventions... This right here, uh, when the curvature is on where the light is coming from, the front of the lens, it was negative. So in this case, the center of curvature is over here, and so it's where it's going to, so that's our positive. So this would be a positive 20. Subtract off. And then it hits this curvature, and then, of course, this curvature is where the light's coming from, so that would be a negative 20. And that's kind of nice because a negative and a negative make a positive. And so this right here becomes 0 0.66. And this becomes 2 over 20, which is 1 over 10, which is, again, about a 0 0.066. And so now I'll just take the reciprocal of that. So 0 0.066 reciprocal. And it looks like about a 15.15 .15 centimeters is the focal length of this lens. And again, notice it's positive. That's a converging lens. It kind of matches what we had been saying about convex lenses. They are positive. They make the light converge. We represent that with a positive number, as you'll see that. And again, this is all table three. Now, here's where it gets a, a, a little more interesting. Fortunately, we did a homework problem like this, so hopefully this isn't too hard. And I even gave you kind of a helpful hint. But because the magnification depends upon how far it is, when you look through these 
uh, lenses. Of course, you kind of have to look through the lens and maybe angle it a little bit so you can see the front of the box and the back of the of the box. It's kind of like if I put my pen in the camera, if I put it, you know, straight nose in, you you really only see the front of the of the pen. But if I if I kind of twist the pen a little bit, you can kind of see the front of it and then the back of it. Or in this case, the top of it and then the, the bottom of it. Well, you're looking probably at a flat screen, so let me call that front. <laughs> and then this, the, the bottom. And what is going to end up happening is this part is going to get magnified more than the, the other part. In fact, I wonder if you would even see that on camera with a like this eraser if I got it close to the lens. I'll angle it so you can see the front and the back and then I'll get close. And hopefully you'll see kind of a little trapezoid effect that the front of it is magnified different than the back of it. And so you get kind of a trapezoid looking Thing. And that's what hopefully we will see here. And so we have this box, which is five by five. Uh, it is placed in the front of in the front edge of the box is 25. So the picture kind of indicates that that's good. Uh, but, and, then, and then we're asking what is the area of the image? And here's the hint, find the shape. And so that's why I was holding the eraser up here. So you can see kind of that trapezoid effect. Um, say it again here. Um, what is the area of the image? And so again, it would be kind of like, here's the area of the image. But as I hold it close to the camera lens, you may ask, what is the area of this down to here, over to here, and back to there? And so we're going to have to be looking at a a trapezoid. Uh, so let's kind of work that out, find the shape. And then it says to do this, you know, find the front and the back edge plus the magnification of the front and the back edge. And so maybe I'll use an F for front and B uh, for, for back. And so let's find Q of the front and Q of the back. And so this will be 1 over F minus 1 over P front, and then reciprocate. And this will be 1 over F minus 1 over P, and this time the object will be the back of the box, and then reciprocate. And, of course, the focal length we just did. The front of the box, we're told, is 25. Uh, that means the back of the box is 30. And so let me keep that in mind as I do my calculation right here. All right, so I'm going to take the 15.15 .15 and take the reciprocal, subtract the front, uh, the, uh, the uh, front, the object distance of the front, uh, take the reciprocal of all of that. And we are looking at a position of about a 38.45. And did everything in centimeters. Uh, whereas the position of the back of the box would be 15.15 reciprocal uh, minus the 30 reciprocal, enter, and the reciprocal of that is about a 30.61. So 30.61. Uh, now, can't really draw because the edge of the paper is here. So I'm going to put it up here at the top. This is the lens. But it looks like it is saying the front of the box is somewhere at 38. So I'll put 38 right here. And the back of the box is somewhere at a 30. And, of course, then the difference between these is the difference between the front and the back of the box on the image.
So let me take that 38 and copy and paste and subtract off the 30.61, copy and paste, hit enter. And we are looking at a 7.85 on the image between the front and the back of the box. And I do know it's going to invert here. Um, although maybe I'll run through the math and show you. I'm just not sure how big it would be. So let me do a magnification of the front of the box as well as a magnification of the back of the box. So this would be negative the 38.45 over its distance of 25. And this one's going to be the negative 30.6 over the 30. And uh, looking at this one then, the 38.45 divided by 25, and actually there's a negative there, so maybe I should put times a negative. Okay, so the magnification is about a 1.5. So it inverts it and makes it bigger. Let me multiply by the 5. And so we're looking at something now that has a height here of about 7.69. And so maybe I'll put here magnification negative 1.54. Okay. Now, this magnification is nearly one. So this back edge right here is going to be nearly a five. Maybe I'll get it a little more accurately. So 30.61 divided by the 30. Oh, and let me not forget the negative. So it's going to invert it. And look at the magnification. I mean, it's only, it is a little bit bigger. It's 2% bigger. So if I multiply it by the original five, we're looking at, a 5.1, so this is like a 5.1 going down. Negative 1.02 for the magnification. And so this is kind of that trapezoid effect where the front of it looks bigger than the back of it. And then of course, ultimately, the question is the area. And so to get area, we've got to, you know, take a trapezoid. I suppose one option, if you've forgotten how to do the area of a trapezoid, is to take the area of a rectangle plus a triangle. But uh, trapezoids, although we don't use them much, they're pretty easy to remember because you take the uh, two different sides, add them together and divide by two. So that's kind of the average of them. And then... The other one, which I'll call it the length of the trapezoid, you multiply it. So it kind of looks like the area of a, of a rectangle. It's just length times width. So here's the length, but it's the width is really kind of an average width. You take the smaller width and the bigger width and add them together and divide by two, so you have an average width. So in our case, we've got the seven point. Six nine, and then we also got the five point one. We can add them together and divide by two. So the average kind of height here, which I guess I called width a moment ago, would be this six point three nine five. So when I multiply it by what I guess I'll call its length, kind of looks more like a width in this picture, but. Not worrying about the, the names. The area then should be about a 50.2 square centimeters. So it should look roughly twice as big. And so hopefully that's kind of what you're seeing. If you look down here, you see a nice rectangle. You pull it in close so that the front edge is closer to the lens and the back. You get kind of this... trapezoid look and its bigger area. All right, so kind of a tough one for B. 
as I said, kind of kind of designed that way, so that A was pretty straightforward, but B is gonna make you think. All right, and same thing here in number four. Uh, again, A is hopefully pretty straightforward. This is our uh, single slit, and uh, so we've got light coming from a single slit, and you might remember the equation a sine theta is an integer wavelength this is gets us our dark spots not to be confused with the double slit where they would give us bright spots and of course we would use the symbol d for the distance between the double slit uh, they give us the wavelength that's uh, projected through a single slit they give us the width we get a diffraction pattern seen on the screen so this is that sync function we talked a lot about. Uh, and then it just says how far up, and we always measure things from the center, so to help you out here, I say, you know, from the center of the screen, is the first dark diffraction minimum. Well, that's where this equation is going to be really, really helpful here. Um, now, it says how far up, so we make this approximation and call sine theta very close to tangent theta, which is y over l. Uh, y being the distance up the screen, and L being, oh, I guess it's already marked there, the length to the screen. And M being which dark one we're looking for, so I'll just replace that with a 1. And so Y uh, becomes lambda times L over A, and now it's just kind of a plug and, and chug. So the wavelength is the 525 nanometers, so I'll put the... 525 times 10 to the minus ninth. Uh, the distance to the screen, it looks like it's one and a quarter meters. Okay, good. Uh, then divide it by the A. A is representing the size of that slit, and so that's 0 0.05 measured in millimeters. So I'll say 10 to the minus three. And it looks like, now that I put everything in meters, uh, one on the bottom will cancel one on the top, leaving me with meters. And so 0 0.131 meters, uh, maybe 1.31 centimeters might be a good way to write the answer for A. And then B is kind of one of these relative changes. You might remember we did some homework problems like that. I don't think we did one exactly with a, a slit, but we did one that had relative rates when we did the lens problem. And I think uh, they were talking about maybe, oh, I, can, I get my classes confused sometimes, but I think you had a problem with an antelope that was moving. And so the this was moving, the object was moving, and therefore the image had to move and uh, you want to keep it in focus or something to that effect. But we remember, hopefully, from Physics 121 and our mechanics that anytime you know position, you also then know velocity and acceleration because those are just the derivative. So if you have an equation for position, take its derivative and now you have an equation for velocity. Um, and, and so it doesn't matter if you're working with mechanical things like we did in 121 or optical things like we did here on the homework with our geometric optics or in this problem we'll do our physical optics or our wave optics we just need to take the derivative because that's what i was saying here do we have an equation for position we do we have an equation that positions uh this is the y the position of the dark spot this a is the positioning of the opening and so when one changes, so does the other. And so if you want to compare the rate of the change of A, and so the opening of the slit, and compare it to the movement of the dark spot, that's what the Y is, just take out the derivative. We, we have this equation. And that's what this is trying to get to. It says the slit is then opened, and it says opened and making it bigger. And it gives you the rate. So this is telling you how A changes with time. This is one millimeter per second. And it's being opened by a small motor. Uh, when the slit is still at this position, so it, it's got to have some position and then it's process of opening. So, you know, why it's at this position, but it is now opening at this rate. At what rate does the dark fringe pattern move? 
um, the, well, the, the first dark diffraction minimum move on the screen. So in other words, will the dark spot move up or down as this opens up? What direction, up or down, does the dark spot move on the screen? So it's asking for both. Uh, what rate and then what direction. And maybe I'll start with the direction, although we'll see it in the math. The direction, hopefully, <coughs> excuse me, is something you you got out of our physical optics. Uh, we said that if you make the slit smaller, and you, and you watched me do this in, in class or on the video lecture, I make it smaller, the dark spots move out. And then as I open it up, they moved in. And that's what this one is. They're, they're opening up. It's making it bigger. And so hopefully we're going to get a down here. We're, so as A gets bigger, Y gets smaller. So there's the direction. In fact, you can see that when you take the derivative. And so let me take the derivative of the position equation as a function of time. And you might say that's kind of a, a review problem. Don't you know position? You also know velocity. You also know acceleration, but we don't need to go that far for, for this problem. So over here, I'm going to say this is how y changes with time. And good. That's what I'd like to know. That's what I need to interpret here. The how y changes with time is this the rate at which the dark minimum is moving. Now, maybe before I actually take the derivative here, I'll kind of rewrite it because the lambda and the length do not change. And so what's nice about derivatives is you can pull them out in front. So I'll just pull them in front and now I can take the derivative of a to the negative one which using our properties of derivatives, you pull down the exponent, so there's a negative one. You reduce the exponent by one. And if it's a composite function, you gotta do the chain rule. And of course, that's what we have. We have how does A change with time? Uh, we're not taking the derivative with respect to A, we're taking the derivative with respect to time. So A depends on time. So you have a function, which in this case is one over A, and then more than that, A depends on time. So we have a composite function. And then, of course, to put in the numbers correctly, we have to interpret the meaning of each of these. But like I said, the meaning of this, how does Y change with time, is the answer to what this is. What rate does the dark spot move? And if we interpret what this means, how does A change with time? That is the opening of it. And then, of course, A is the size of the opening. And by the way, you can see this negative 1 is going to tell me then that whatever direction the A is changing, which in this case is getting bigger, so this is going to be a positive number, then with that negative there, we're going to get a negative, and so Y gets smaller. So as A gets bigger, Y gets smaller, right there because of that negative. So it would look, I guess, something like this. We would have a negative and we could put in our wavelength, 525 times 10 to the minus nine. Uh, our length to our screen, 1.25. Uh, the size of the screen, no, I'm sorry, the size of the, the, the slit, the opening, uh, 0 0.0. 5 times 10 to the minus 3 raised to a negative 2 power. And then this is the rate at which it's opening, which is 1 millimeter per second. And I'll put it in meters. Which, if you look at your units, that would be meters, meters, and then we cancel off with those meters. And then you would just get to have meters per second. Now, I should be very careful about my sign because if it's opening, this is then a plus, getting bigger, which is why this is gonna come out to be negative. All right, so a lot of interpretation here of our numbers. And let me put them in here. Okay, 
So I'll just put the negative right away. 525 times 10 to the negative 9 for here times 1.25 times... I'm trying to think of how the best way... If I should put that downstairs because it's a negative. Now I'll just do this. 0 0.05 times 10 to the negative 3. Close that. Raise it to a negative 2. And then finally times 1 times 10 to the negative 3. All right, so after all this calculator work, it's 0 0.263, and I've done everything then in meters per second. Uh, I suppose if we want to go back to millimeters to kind of compare it, the movement and the opening of the slit, because remember the slit is on really kind of a small rate, one millimeter per second, but the dark spot is now moving down at a really fast rate, 263 millimeters per second. All right, so again, a little uh, easy one with A and then a little more thinking in our derivative and, you know, connected to the homework. So hopefully you, you caught that connection here. And if, if you didn't catch it immediately, hopefully my hints there helped. All right. And kind of the same thing here. Although I wish on my picture, I wish I would have found a picture that had the intensity sideways because that's how we did it in class. We always kind of drew it sideways here. And it would match more of what we did in four. And it would match better on part A when it says how far up measured from the center. So this would probably read better if I had said how far to the right given the way the picture is oriented. But I do think one of the hardest things to get out of our physical optics was the combination of chapter 37 and 38 because we did chapter 37 and we had something that looked like this we said the diffraction pattern got bright dark bright dark bright dark bright dark bright dark bright dark and followed kind of this cosine squared pattern but yet when we actually built it and put it on the board we saw something that looked more like this. Yeah, it would go bright, dark, bright, dark, but the intensity tapered off. And in chapter 37, we had no explanation for that. And that's why I said, well, we, we got to keep talking also about diffraction. So when you have both the interference effect and the diffraction effect, you get this net result. So here it says we have two slits. And they are illuminated with wavelength of... 632 nanometers. The diffraction pattern is viewed on the screen 2.35 meters away from the double slit. Okay. How far to the right is the first bright fringe? Well, this first one, just how far on the screen, really doesn't matter that the first one is a little dimmer like we learned in totality after doing chapter 38, or if we just go back to what we did in chapter 37, and we had this easy equation that found where are the bright spots due to our interference. And if you remember, we did that first before we got to the more sophisticated equation that actually gave us the intensity anywhere on the screen. And in chapter 37, that was without this diffraction envelope. It would just gave us this one. And so A is pretty easy because we don't need the diffraction envelope of 38, and we don't even need really much of the interference 
because we're not asked to find, you know, where is it 30% or 40% or something harder, which is where is its bright spot. So we can use this and do the small angle approximation, y over l. Uh, we're looking for the first one, and so this would just simply say y would be a lambda l over d to just kind of say, okay, where is this first bright one? And so this, I'll put a little C for center, and then this would be what we call M equal one. Okay, so grabbing my calculator to find out where the bright spot is. Not Again, not worrying about that it's tapered off a little bit. That doesn't matter. And we're right at the brightest spot, so we don't need this more sophisticated one. We just need the one that this is where the bright spots are. And so we'll put in the wavelength, 632 times 10 to the negative 9. Uh, the length to the screen now is a little more than 2 meters. And D, it says two slits are separated by, so we'll go 0 0.04 millimeters. And so we're looking at about 0 0.371 meters. Uh, maybe switching it over to... Centimeters, uh, yeah, I don't know how best to write it. Maybe I'll just write it as uh, 3.71 centimeters. So that's what I'd, I'd get when I moved it to centimeters. All right, now B, to be honest, is, is, is here to kind of water down the value of the points of C, which is a hard one, and then B is, an, is really kind of an easy one. Because it says here, then, putting both the double slit interference of chapter 37 and the diffraction of 38, so that's what I've been talking about for the last few minutes together, what is the equation of the intensity on the screen? And then here's a big hint. <laughs> this is equation number three in chapter 38. <laughs> and even says this is supposed to be an easy one to make up. So if you if you look that up, you'll see that what we have is the equation I was just talking about, the, the effect of the interference of the two slits, but also the effect of the diffraction. And so this is the sink function, and this is the interference, and so that's kind of what this dotted line represents, this, this factor, the overall diffraction envelope. And so this first part is a part we got in chapter 38 where it just went bright, dark, bright, dark, and a little more sophisticated than this one. This one just tells us where the brights are. But when we threw in this extra factor, this could tell us where the intensity is anywhere on the screen. But that was not complete either because it didn't have the, what we call self-interference within a single slit. That, that required us to then jump into chapter 38. So when we put all of that together for the grand finale, we get this equation. Now, I don't think your author writes it in terms of their face. I'll take it either way. But uh, what this means is the phase difference between the two slits divided by 2. So that would be a pi d sine theta over lambda. And then beta for the single slit is the phase difference between, if you have a single slit, we can't really say the first and the second or the two, because there's not two. We chop the, a single slit into an infinite number of pieces. And so we said beta is the phase between the, the first one, and then as you add up one edge of the slit, you add all the way down to the other edge of the slit. Beta is the phase between that first one and the last one. And I guess the last one is the infinite one because we added up an infinite number of them. And so this would be a pi a sine theta over lambda. But you can see the same structure 
in the equation. And when you say it that way, it makes it pretty easy to memorize. So that's why I like to do that. Uh, but again, you don't have to memorize it. You, in fact, for you, you've got to go look it up and copy it down. Because we're going to try to solve this. And you can see this is a pretty nasty looking equation. And then that's what C is all about. Although, again, maybe the hard part of C really isn't so much solving this equation because the hardest part of solving it I gave you the solution for. You'd have to kind of do a Taylor series on our sine functions. That's how I solved it getting ready for the exam. So you don't have to, to solve that, but you do got to know what all this means. And so more than any other equation, you can't just plug in and chug here. You, you really got to know what these things mean here. So I'll turn the page because at least those of you who did the test in, in, in person gave you a whole extra a page here to kind of work this out. Okay, so it says, when both the double slit interference and the diffractions are considered, we get an intensity pattern as shown. And so that's this. Also like the figure in 38.7. So that's the part of the book where they're trying to explain why we have both of these going on at the same time. And given by the equation in part B, which is also this equation. So this figure and this equation are side by side there in the book. This makes the first bright fringe a little bit dimmer than the center. So what I'm trying to say here is, you know, this is why in 37 we said they were just as bright, but in reality they weren't when we, when we saw them in the uh, experiment. And then that's what this picture is trying to draw. The, the, the center one is really bright, but the first bright fringe has dropped down a little bit. It, it, the first bright fringe isn't quite as intense. And in part A, we found that that's about 3.7 centimeters over. And that's what this is. If the first bright fringe is only 90% as bright as the center one, what then is the size of the slit? And then I give you a bunch of hints here. It says, use the equation for part B. Okay, so I'm going to use this. Uh, here is a solution that you'll probably need, so let's keep that in the back of our mind. Also, I'm not going to count this for a whole lot of points. It's only worth five points, so do this last. The other equations are worth more, and they're all so easier. And then also watch your calculator because these are in real numbers, not degrees. And so if you remember way back in number one, I switched my calculator over to degrees. And so let me switch it over to radians now and have some real numbers in here. Okay, so let's give this some thought as we go to do part C. Maybe I'll even start C on this page before I, I turn it. Because there's something that's hopefully really nice about here. We're trying to say that the intensity is 90% of I naught. But we're also saying it's 90% at the second bright fringe. And so the second bright fringe, you can go through a lot of work using the value of Y and L here. But this right here, the reason it was a bright fringe is this all came out to be 1. So I'm going to save myself a little bit of effort and just say, look, I already know what that's going to come out to be. Why waste my time? That's just one. That's what the bright fringe meant. That's what this means. If you take that value of Y and Y over L and you put it all into here, you know, I mean, you could, you could even see, look what Y is equal. It's got a, a lambda on top, so that's going to cancel off. Okay. Um, then the sine is the Y over the L. Maybe in my mind I can move the L over to there, but I would have a, a Y over L for this, okay? And that Y over L would be a lambda over a D, which would cancel that. And you're only going to be left with pi when you do that. So this is clearly the cosine of pi, which is negative 1. And you square it, you get a 1. Exactly. So either conceptually or mathematically, you put all that together, you're just wasting your time working on that one. 
Now, maybe to make my life a little bit easier, maybe I'll call all this stuff in here X because I have a feeling it's gonna look a little bit like this. So I'm just gonna call this sine squared X over X squared. Because when I do that, then I can get rid of the initial. And if I take the square root of 0.9, so square root of 0.9, I get 0.949. So 0.949, and I move x to the other side, and I get sine x. Ah. All right. So... Like I said, you're probably going to come across this equation. If you ever see point 0.949x equals sine x, the answer is x equals 0.557. Now, again, fortunately, you don't have to solve that, but put that in your calculator. Um, now, I was going to put it in. But if you put that into here and you put that into here, you'll see those two sides are equal. All right, so that's my solution. And that X means all that stuff in here. So over here, I'm just going to say, so X, which is 0.557, is supposed to equal this pi A sine theta over lambda. And I'm trying to find the A. Now, remembering then the sine theta would be this y over L. I can put all that stuff in. So if I rearrange this, 0.557 times a lambda times an L divided by a pi and also divided by a y should equal my A. So... There it is, 0.557 times the lambda. And this was the uh, 632, 632 nanometers. The length, I think that was the 235, wasn't it? 235. Uh, then divide by a pi and also divide by the y. We got back here, y was... Uh, let me do it to point zero, point zero three seven one, and so I get an A value that looks like about a seven point one zero. That what it rounds to one zero times ten to the minus six meters. So if you want seven point one zero micrometers, yay! So there is my value of A. A little bit of math, but mostly it's not math. Mostly it's an understanding of what the heck did all this mean? So a lot of work for five points, but hopefully you got it. All right. I'll call it quits. It looks like it took me a little more than an hour, but hopefully it was engaging and learning. Bye.